What's up, everyone? Today I have with me Lorna Byrne. Lorna Byrne is a world-renowned spiritual teacher and philanthropist who has been featured extensively on television worldwide. And she's the author of several best-selling books, including her memoir, Angels in My Hair, the true story of a modern-day Irish mystic. Lorna, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on your show, um, Josh. Um, I'm looking forward to just getting into conversation with you. Same here. So, Lorna, you know, as I ask all my guests, um, tell us a little bit about yourself, like what your life was like growing up. And then if you can, please share with us not just your near-death experience, but also your experience with the angels. Well, I, I suppose, you know, to give a little bit from the get beginning, from the time I was an infant, I could see angels, but I didn't know they were angels. You must, you must remember, because I was only an infant. It was maybe when I was about two and a half or three, when I was sitting in front of the fire playing with my brother, and we were playing with blocks, little wooden blocks my dad had made. And it was like his hand touched mine, but it was like our hands went into each other and it just all sparkled. And I just felt so much warmth and love. And I burst out laughing because this was my brother I was playing with then. And what was going on, you know, in that in that way. And it was at that moment the angels that were around us told me that I must keep it a secret that they were angels. And that was the first time they used that word. And they said to me, my brother was a soul. He had died before I was born. And many a time, you have to remember, I was only an infant as such, you know, I wasn't even seven, like I was two and a half, going on three, maybe. And at times I would have seen my mom, she'd fall asleep in the chair at the fire. And I would see my brother in her arms as an infant, but I never questioned it, you know, at, at all. And he, seemingly he had died at 10, at 10 weeks. So from that moment on, when the angels told me they were angels, and then they were constantly reminding me, you know, to keep it a secret, not to say anything to anyone. And, you know, as I grew, I understood why because I was considered retarded because I'm severely dyslexic. So they were protecting me. But I do love, you know, they have been the best teachers and friends in my life, and they're still in my life today. I, I see them physically, as I see you on the screen, but I don't see your guardian angel. That seldom happens on the screen, <laughs> you know, in that in that way. And, and I, I suppose my life has just been one miracle after another, but those miracles have helped hundreds and thousands of people in the world. And that's what life is about. I have had so many near death experience. I'm not the ordinary patient, I'm afraid. So it's kind of, you know, every time I have something that has to be looked after medically, you know, surgery and, and all of that, I usually die. You know, and sometimes, you know, it just it just happens. Um I even remember the time I I I died and and went to heaven with my baby. One day I had said to to Joe, I wasn't feeling well, you know, your and we, your husband at the time. My husband, yeah. And I lay down on the couch. And you know, I died on, on the couch. And even though I could, I had left my body with my baby because God had already told me, I'm skipping, not giving you the whole story because we'd be here for ages. But God had told me that my baby was going to heaven. It, it wasn't, wasn't going to stay. And when it happened, I died at the same moment because I wanted to go with my baby. You know, and I, I guess that does happen, mothers, you know, as well. And, and that's important to, to remember. But I remember going towards the light and my baby in my arms and looking back at Joe and seeing my human body on the couch, you know, and he shaking me and begging me to come back, you know, in a state of panic. And... 
just looking back at him and then looking at my baby in my arms. I just continued on towards the light, up that spiral staircase until I met this beautiful angel standing in front of me. And this beautiful angel had her arms out to take my baby and telling me I had to go back. But I wasn't listening. My soul didn't want to. The human essence within my soul wanted to go with my baby. You know, and I was even then told to look back again, you know, and that's an amazing thing. It's like as if you are billions of miles away and where you have to look back, um, it's like it's in a ball in a sense and, and, and you see it so clearly. I could see Joe so stressed, terrified that I had just died on him there on the couch. You were having complications with your pregnancy, is that why? Yeah, I was having complications and my baby did die, you know. Um, but the angel saying, you know, I had to go back. But then God spoke with, how would I say this? When God speaks with authority, you know, it's kind of, okay, you know, <laughs> I, I, I gave my baby. Um, I can't describe God's voice that way when he, when God speaks with that authority, but it's like I knew I had no choice when God spoke. When God said, Lorna, you go back. You, you have to go back now, you know, and handing my baby over to the angel and the angel taking the baby from my arms, you know, and seeing the angel holding the baby. And then I having to go back. And I remember my soul traveling back through all of that light. And the human essence within my soul was just in tears. But then when I entered my body that time, how would I say it? I had a huge amount of pain. Um, it, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. It was... Um, horrific pain. It was like as if, how would I say, I felt every particle of my body, every hair, every piece of nail, every part of me was in pain at that time. But I think that was because of as well the, the essence of my soul and the human essence of myself, knowing that my baby was gone. My baby, you know, wasn't surviving. You know, I, I think that's what all of that pain was part of in that in that way. Yeah, that must have been hard. It was. It was. Now, the one that I am familiar with, um, the first story that I heard of yours was the one when you had um, problems with your stomach as a child and because you grew up, you know, I don't want to give too much detail, but you know, I'd rather yeah. have you share, but do you mind sharing that incident, like what the angels told you about your stomach and then what happened from there? Yeah, I am. Um, I don't know which parts you're looking for. That's <laughs> the thing because it, it's, you have to remember, this is my whole life. So yeah. from the very beginning, I had trouble with my stomach and I never complained to my parents. And In what then sense? It, Were there issues with your stomach? What did you mean? Um, it was that it didn't work properly. So I, I have no bowel now. It's all gone. So everything is gone in that way. So they just had to remove a huge amount and, you know, take all of the bowel out. It wasn't cancerous or that, but it was um, the wrong way around or whatever. It just, it, it's, it stopped working altogether. So as a child, I had lots of problems with it. But then it got to the stage that, you know, the angels had said to me, you know, you have to go to the doctor, you have to tell the doctor, you know. 
and see what happens. And and again, that was an incredible story, you know, because the first time I said it to my doctor, you know, he sent me to a specialist, you know, and that specialist kind of didn't take on anything that I was saying, what was wrong. But then I went to another specialist, which was DC, and seemingly the angels organized that um, through somebody I had met. And I had just said, oh, God, my tummy is killing me. I already knew what was wrong because the angels and God had told me that it was the bowel. And they had already told me it will all come out. Everything will have to be taken out. And they told me, you know, it would be major surgery I would have to have. I was a public patient, so we had no money. But he didn't treat me like a public patient. So I I went for, for the surgery. Um, so I know you like to be asked a lot of questions. And so I have a lot of, you yeah. know, a good number of questions for you. Just hearing your story from, you know, from another interview where you did die and because you had those issues with your stomach and the intestines were taken out. But the angels told you at a young age that there was something wrong with your stomach. One question that I know can come up would be, uh, did they did the angels not have the ability to heal your stomach at that time instead of just telling you you have a problem? I I don't have a problem with that, you know, myself. And I know lots of people would say, well, why didn't God heal you? But I would say, you know, I wouldn't be who I am today. I wouldn't have had the spiritual experiences I've had today. You know, if if my tummy had been healed or I had been born with, you know, all my insides developed properly, you know, I still wouldn't be who I am today. So to me, all of this is normal and natural. You know, it, it brought me on a journey and I don't feel negative about it at all. Like I wouldn't have been in the hospitals at certain times when, you know, other people, strangers needed me, even though they knew nothing about me, you know, and I wouldn't have told them, maybe gone and hold their hand or, you know, stood close beside them, just like a little child one time, you know, in a hospital that the parents had brought in, you know, the child was in horrific pain and, they weren't being attended to. So I was told to get up and go over and sit near the child. And I done that. And the child became calm. And then all of a sudden, you know, five minutes later, you know, a nurse comes along and says, oh, this child we have to take in right now, you know, in that in that way. So, you know, even though I had huge problems with my insides, To me, that's okay. That's that's okay because in me having those problems, you know, God used me as a tool, if you like, in that in that way to be in places to help others without them knowing anything about me because I kept it a secret all my life. It was only when angels in my hair came out that the world started to know And the same with my children. My children would say, Mom, we knew there was something different, but we could never put our finger (laughs) on it. You know, in that in that way. Like so to me, I never expect it. And even today, I don't expect God to heal my human body. Because to me, my human body is not the important part, it's my soul, it's the spiritual part. And I, and I know in the future, as as we grow more spiritually and become more open, you know, more of the intertwining will happen of the body and soul coming together. Like, I'm not meant to be alive today. So there's the miracle. You know, I have died so many times. Our human body has aches and pains, you know, and at many, on many occasions, it just heals itself. You know, um, it just happens. And to me, my body has healed itself many, many a times. But just things weren't 
you know, the way a plant is sometimes meant to grow dead straight and no lumps on it. Well, mine kind of didn't grow dead, dead straight in, in that, that way. But yeah. I'm healthy. I'm considered very healthy and I'm just considered a miracle. So you're saying pretty much that um, during that time, even as a child, um, even though, you know, there's, there is a possibility to be healed in a way, you're kind of glad that you didn't heal in that, you know, what we would call a miraculous way because it made you who you are today. And because it brought you on a journey to become who you are and to be able to help other people who are su suffering alongside of you. And yeah, it, it's, it's like, you know, being considered retarded you know, because I'm severely dyslexic and, and way back in Ireland then they, they didn't even know about dyslexic, you know. Um, so I wasn't educated by man. So in a sense, you know, I find it confusing why mankind does what it does. I don't understand you, by the way, <laughs> you know, in the, in that in that way. So in that way, I, I was protected because... I have been educated by the angels. They have taught me everything I know, literally everything thing I know. So I know you've probably had so many of these experiences, it's just so normal. Even the way you were saying it, I noticed it's just like a very normal. I went out of my body, I went straight to heaven, I saw this. <laughs> but I know for someone who's never had those kinds of experiences, they'd be like, what? <laughs> you know, you saw God, you saw millions of souls. Do you mind describing to kind of give like a, like a visual for us? When you say you heard God and you saw souls, like what does that look like if you're able to give some sort of description? How how can I I, I would to say the best of your ability. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's it's at times quite hard to describe. I, I struggle because we don't have human words. You could take all the words from from the Bible. You know, most of the time God speaks gently and softly. It's only on occasion, on occasions like the time with my baby, I had to go back with that authority. And let's say it was like thunder. It was, you know, I knew I had no choice. I knew I had to go, had to go back. Yeah. So and when you're out of your body hearing God with this thunderous voice, is it like an audible thing or is it just kind of like a thought? No, I hear Oh, you hear so, it like it's like I, 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 okay. Yeah, I never explained to you, like, um, I see the angels physically, as I said, I see you. So when they, if Archangel Michael was here at this very moment, I would hear him in the same way as I hear your voice. Okay. How would you know it's Archangel Michael? Um, well, I know it's you on the screen, don't I? Right. So if Archangel Michael came here and stood beside me, I would see him as I see you, but he'd be here. So it's just yeah. more of like a like a knowingness. You just know, right? Because instead of like for another person, they can say, oh, there's an angel there. But I don't know who it is, but it's an angel. But you are emphatic that it's archangel. Is it just a knowingness then? No, I see. I see physically. Like you do see me, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's the same way. I, I see. I see. Oh, I know, I know. I know like you, you see the angel in front of you like it's a physical person, but like knowing that it's specifically Archangel Michael. Oh, yeah. Like it's, of course, you would know Archangel Michael. <laughs> or, okay, or okay. You, you know Archangel Gabriel. You'd know an Archangel. Um, I always explain if, if you had, you know, millions of angels and you put an archangel in, hidden in among them, you would spot straight away. It's just like if you had a whole load of soldiers or people all dressed the same, but you put the general. Of course you'd find the general because there'd be something completely different about them in that, in that way. But sometimes angels talk to me. I Sometimes I would say it's like a three-way system or or a five-way system in the sense of I'm I'm all the time listening, you know, but I, I hear their voice as I hear yours. Okay. But sometimes yeah. they speak another language. But angels are very, very beautiful. They are this incredible light as well, just like our soul. But they give this beautiful, I have to say beautiful, 
um, human appearance, whether they give a male appearance or a female appearance, they are neither. But whichever one they give, it's perfect. And no human being is as perfect in, in that way, because you know the way we might have a blemish or a scratch or something like that, but they would never have anything like that. And I always love, you know, at different times in my life, um, someone turned around and said, oh, Lorna, I saw you with that handsome young man. Who was he? You know, <laughs> and it, it's, it's like the time which I, I tell the story all the time when I was in Maynooth College and I was with Archangel Michael. He was walking beside me, but he always does the same thing. He will dress the same as every other man around. So it was Maynooth College. It was where there was priests, where there was young men going to become deacons and then priests. And just this day, you know, we were walking up the avenues of the trees and um, these are the two priests. I saw them in the distance coming our direction. And the amazing thing was that they said, good morning, Father, to Archangel Michael. It was like I was invisible. I wasn't there, you know. Um, so people often do see angels, just that they don't recognize. But if you ever think that you've seen someone so perfect, more than likely, that was an angel. And it was there for a reason. And but many people do experience angels. You know, the way you often hear rescue workers saying, you know, we rescued this man or woman, you know, we got to them as quickly as we could. But they turned around and they asked who was the other person that was right, with them before right. they came. And that's, that's well documented, you know. That, that way, or or a mountain climber saying, you know, I was being guided. I could see someone walking in front of me. Who were they? But I couldn't catch up on them in that in that way. And they got out of the situation they were in until they were actually rescued humanly in that in that way as well. Angels are just. They're just so, so beautiful. I, I see them physically every day. I know if you were in this room and the light of your guardian angel opened up, I could describe it to you clearly. You know, just like Archangel Michael, you know, sometimes when I was out fishing with my dad or when I was out in the forest here, Archangel Michael would even have the wellies on. He would look... But even the clothes now, when I think of it, it's like the creases in the clothes are just perfect, you know, in that in that way. And they do have a light about them, you know, and I, I think that's why, in a sense, you know, the priests in the college acknowledged him. And it was his light, in a, in a sense, that blinded them. This is something I've never said before, blinded them from seeing me with him. You know, and I remember those priests even had prayer books in their hands. They were saying prayers, you know, or just like the the lady who lived in the area, you know, and again, she had asked, you know, who was that man I was with, that handsome man, you know, in that in <laughs> sense. My husband was very handsome, you know, <laughs> in, that, in that way. Like, but but he was a redhead. <laughs> but, um, angels, angels appear, and I would always say to everyone: everyone has a guardian angel. I have never seen any human being, and I have been traveling all over the world, and I've never seen any human being without a guardian angel. And that's the one angel that cannot leave you even for one second. Other angels come and go. You could have. 10 around you or 100 around you, but they come, come, go. Yeah, but it is your guardian angel. Yeah, that just cannot leave you, not even for, for one second. And it loves you unconditionally. And it's your number, to your guardian angel, you are its number one. And it's the gatekeeper of your soul. And I love that. And I, I love the way 
your guardian angel loves you no matter what you do. Even if you get annoyed with someone or, you know, sometimes someone will say to me, well, that lad or that woman or that family, they're really nasty and bad. How could they have guardian angels? Or sometimes somebody would say, how, how could Hitler have had a guardian angel? But he had. Because I have never seen any human being without a guardian angel, I have to smile. That means every human being has a soul, that spark of light of God. So, you know, not to be afraid of death, but not to take your life because your life is precious. And that's always one thing I'm always afraid of when you speak of near-death experiences or anything like that, that somebody says, oh, well, that seems much better than my human life, so I will kill myself. So I'm just saying to your listeners, if they dare, I'll bash them. Mm -hmm. It is not allowed because your life is precious no matter what you're going through. And most important thing is to remember and allow yourself to see all the blessings and the good things that are there. You're alive today. You're actually alive. So it's like feel life inside of you because, again, you know, in a hospital again, you know, and seeing a young man coming in after being in a car crash and, you know, already loads of the doctors have saved, saved his life, loads of things have been done and seeing his bed surrounded by his family, but seeing so many angels and the healing angels around him, helping him. But the most shocking thing was to see the terror in the young man's eyes, in his face. You know, that part was horrific. And just watching, and this is something I haven't told, just watching one of the healing angels, you know, how would I say it, reach out and, and put its hand, you know, like this over him, you know, and the young man becoming that slight bit more calmer and calmer, and then he fell asleep. You know, um, I could tell you loads of stories. Yeah. I, I know that yeah. young man had a near-death experience, but I don't think he ever wrote about it. Or maybe, you know, he had such, how would I say, he, he was going to survive, but he was going to have a different type of life altogether. You know, life would never be what it was before. And that's why I say, you know, enjoy life. If you can get up, and hop on one leg, you can smile, you can eat, you can drink, you can wave your arms, you know, you can see, you can hear, you can speak. Don't deny those gifts that you have. Mm -hmm. You know, if one of them are taken away, how would you feel? You know, so mm -hmm. life is, is precious. So that's why I always, and I, I'm even when I'm doing workshops, I'd have to say sometimes to someone, don't you dare. And I point like this, don't you dare. And they know what that means without me even saying the words. Yeah. Life is so precious. Um, so according to you, everyone has a guardian angel, no matter how, how quote unquote evil they were, right? Yeah. Um, but then there are some other angels that kind of come and go depending on, the task that's necessary yeah. at a particular time in your life. I know there are some people who would ask questions like, okay, if I've always had this guardian angel with me since day one, where was this guardian of mine during this tragic or traumatic experience that mm -hmm. I was going through, whether it's through abuse or something like something very horrific, right? Where yeah. Yeah. Um, th these are the obvious questions that come up for people that hear these kinds of these ideas, you know, especially from a skeptical perspective. Because they were saying, okay, he's my guardian. Was he just, was this angel just watching me suffer and get abused? Um, and then no, what would be their it, role, right? Like what's their role in, in, in being a guardian? Their role is to, you know, to bring your soul back home to heaven when the time comes and only when the time comes. 
But the other part of the role is to help to guide you through your life and to protect you as much as possible. And if you were a child when you were being abused, you know, something horrific happened. And I have met many children where this has happened. Your guardian angel is already working with the the guardian angel of the person who's the abuser to try and get them to change their mind, not to do the evil. And even with other human beings that may be around in the area at the same time to help to guide the person not to do wrong. But most of the time we don't listen. And to me, that is the sad, the sad thing. But someone that has got, gone through something like that and maybe umpteen times and are still here today, I have to smile at that. You know, that's, that's evidence that your guardian angel has been working with you to help you to cope with it and get through it and still live life. You know, I, I met a mother there who exactly what you have said was severely abused from her childhood right up to 14 years of age. And she did say that at times she wondered where her guardian angel is. But then she turned around and said, well, my guardian angel must have given me strength. The strength that I didn't realize I ever had, because look at me today. I'm, I'm a married woman and I love my husband, even though I was severely abused. But I have two beautiful children. And... It was like, you know, the love that that she has and the strength that, that she has. Sometimes that question is very hard to answer because we often say, even now where there's war, well, why doesn't God do something? But God has given us this beautiful planet and has given us free will. We don't have to do wrong. We have a choice. You know, and again, in the past, children were abused and, you know, and still are being abused in, in, in different places where it's considered all right or you don't talk about it in that, in that way. I know in Ireland has changed an awful lot. Um, I don't know whether it has changed a lot where, where you are, but again, the guardian angels and God is asking us to speak speak up. He's asked you even to ask this question, not just that it has come from your 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 followers in that that sense, but for it to be brought up more and brought out into the open. So it's like, don't be afraid to express or talk about the trauma you have gone through. And then if you recognize it in someone else, you know, or that it's happening in someone else, like I could tell you a story about and it was horrific what I saw. You know, this little girl, I'd say she was about seven or eight, and her little brother. And her little brother was only about maybe four or five. And all of the time, as she walked along the wall to use the bathrooms in a public place, um, she was shielding her little brother. So nobody would see him. And I saw him. Do you know that child was black and blue from head to foot? Mm. He was, I, it's nearly bringing, I don't want to cry, you know. Um, he was just black and blue. And she knew if anyone passed comment or said anything and her father heard it, he would be beaten again, and so would she. So I had to ignore it. The angel said, ignore it. Um, and then the other part of the story, skipping, because it was, it was horrific to see. The father did come in at one stage, you know, into the public area and looked around and, you know, let us shout at the little little girl to hurry up to get into the loo and out. And I pretend I didn't notice anything because I was doing what God and the angels had said. 
but a friend of mine kind of turned the corner and at the time the the little girl and the boy were leaving and the father told them to hurry up and I just said to my friend do you know where that family is from and he glanced over and he said yes again God had this person this man walk around at the right time and to glance over but not to cause an issue you know and I told him what I saw and I said let's go and get help help save the child and that's what what happened you know but how are those two little ones going to grow up you know there's going to be so much pain and hurt you know, and just seeing that little boy, literally, you know, his head and all, he was black and blue. Yeah, because I know, I know even from a child's perspective who was, you know, if they were being, yeah. they were probably wondering, well, where was my guardian angel in that? So I guess what you're saying is that our guardian angel is more so like just influencing people's minds, like, like the scenario would be, uh, you know, your guardian angel is helping to communicate to the, fa the abusive father's guardian angel to, hey, yes. don't do that. But because of the free will and the volition that we have, people unfortunately make the bad choices. But the angel's role is kind of like physically hands off. So it's not like the angel will grab yeah. the dad's hand and stop it. <laughs> yeah. it's more so yeah. of like influencing the minds and the hearts of the people. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And, and, that, and that is right. And, you know, Today in the world, you know, we got enough, we became very cold hearted, mankind did, and now we're working to become warm hearted. You know, like now we're starting to have in schools to teach children well being, you know, how to be kind and loving. And I would often say, why did mankind lose that? Why does it have to be taught in school? It should be part of everyday life. It should be natural. Right. You know, but we have been taught that life is only about the material things and only in a sense you being on top and it doesn't matter who you're crushing below, you know, in that in that way. So we have to put a little gift everyone can give themselves this Christmas. And that would be just a little bit of love and to put that into the pocket of your heart you know for yourself so you can be kinder and more loving to others but mainly to yourself because I always tell everyone you can't love anyone any more than you love you so I, I hope that has answered some of the question yeah you, yeah yeah you asked yeah, there was there was one more I would like to ask before you know we conclude yeah, that I know is on is on people's hearts too. So when you're speaking, I notice you're saying God said the angels told me, um, but then if you were to speak to someone else, it will say Jesus told me, God told me, Holy Spirit told me, or if you speak to someone to spirituality, say my spirit guide told me. For I know this would be on people's minds. How do you distinguish between the voices between a guardian angel and your spirit guide or God? Or just your subconscious? I, I think um, sometimes angels are called in different cultures by different names. So in another culture, it could be called your spirit guide. You know, so, so many different names. But I always remember the time when I said yes to God, I would write. And miracles happened. You know, someone gave me a laptop, another stranger set everything up. As dyslexic, you know, press this button, that button, you know, <laughs> that, in that way. Yeah, and I still cool. do the same today, you know. Um, but what was the question again? I have lost oh, just, it. Uh, you, know, cause, you know, because we hear different voices, right? Whether it's our, oh, yeah. say it's our yeah. own thoughts. But I guess you're, you're kind of saying depending upon your culture, your worldview, your religion, I'm assuming, right? We'll attribute it to whatever our, our worldview is. Right. But yeah, you do see a distinction between a spirit guide and a, a guardian angel, or do you see them as I, I, th I think the spirit guide and the guardian angel 
are probably one and the same. It depends on the culture, you know, and what their traditions are, what their beliefs are in that in that way. It's just like, you know, you one thing you always have to remember, you know, God or your guardian angel or your spirit guide will never ask you to do anything wrong. So if you're doing wrong, it's that's nothing to do with the spiritual part of you. That is the human part of you that is doing wrong. That's the human part that wants revenge or is jealous or hate. That, that's not your soul at all. It's like the man who said to me, Lorna, how can you, how can you kill um, revenge? You know, he seemingly he had read my book. And again, this is another miracle. And I was in a hotel. Okay, I was in the lobby. I had been sitting down talking to someone and they had left. And then this stranger, a man, walks over and sits down beside me and says, I've read your book, Angels in My Hair. And he said, Lorna, how can you kill revenge? And he tells me this story about, you know, his family in a worn, torn country and what's happening today, someone going in with a gun and killing his family. And he escaped being with two or three other members of his family. And he was only, I don't know, a teenager or whatever, a young, a young kid. And he said the first thing he did because he had so much anger inside of him and hate, he did the same. He did the same. And that's why he said, how can you kill revenge? And he said, I only realized that when I read Angels in My Hair. And I looked at my wife and my two little girls. And I realized that I had gone in with the gun and done the very same thing. And he said, how can you kill revenge? And that's happening in the world today. You know, we have children saying, what did I do wrong? They have done nothing wrong. So we have to show them love and kindness. Yeah. You know, um, I don't understand why mankind is fighting over land and material things. That's the part I don't understand. What are you fighting over? And I, I know... It's all about material things. But when your human body dies, you cannot bring any material thing to heaven with you. Nothing, you know. So why not, you know, share it? Like everything God gives to me, I give back to the world. And that's the way it should be. Well, that's the way I believe it should be. And, and we shouldn't be hurting each other, you know. We should just love. Yeah. And I love you. I, yeah. I don't care who you are. And again, it's like the man who said, and again, another man said, he couldn't understand for quite a while. He was in such shock why someone gave their life for his. And they said to him, as that happened, because you're worth it. But he didn't understand the words at the time because you were with it. Sorry, I keep talking. Sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. I mean, yeah, definitely love love is the answer with all the things that are happening in the world today. You know, that's what I would encourage all of the, our viewers and listeners to have give a little bit of love and kindness to someone today who may need it because everyone has a story and everyone's going through something, no matter who they are. Everyone has issues in their lives. And even if there's an appearance that everything's okay. There's probably still something behind the scenes going on that they're just exactly. not talking about. So love is the answer. And I appreciate that. Uh, Lorna, what is what is sanctuary? Can you tell us about that? More about that? Um, sanctuary again is a, a huge miracle. It's something that I knew from the time I was a child, um, but didn't quite understand. The word confain is an Irish word, but translated to English, it means sacred place. My family had said, you know, you can't keep on traveling six to nine months out of the year. And that's what I, I was doing. So they started down here um, in Thomastown to look for 
maybe a room we could rent that I could talk with people, you know, do do some things. It's it's the beginning of what would I say, part of the intertwining of the human body and the soul in that way. And it is where, you know, I do workshops and give talks, do so many things. So the sanctuary, it's like it's a it's a sacred place that you were saying it'll be a place yeah. of um like prayer and healing, just what from what I was saying from the website. And this is something also probably makes it even easier for you. So you don't even have to travel so much, but they'll have people who come to that part of the world, they'll be able to have more of a one-on-one, more intimate time getting to be with you, be with Lorna, <laughs> you know, and yeah. to learn from <laughs> you. And you could kind of call it like a spiritual center sort of ish. Yeah, you know? It's more than that, I'm sure. Um, it's it's more it's more than that and i i know it'll change over time and and some of the other things that i was shown is that there will be a school not a school like what we know school is today it's like from all around the world children will be sent teenagers will be sent you know those in universities it's like those um in offices well, i only know offices now you know young men or older men in suits and things like that will will come it's it's like the continuation of spiritual growth continues so that information of sanctuary that's on your website can you tell us your website lornaburn.com lornaburn.com okay yeah so that's l o r n a and then burn is b y r n e Dot com and the information of sanctuary is there and also just your work is there yeah. i could definitely sense it just talking to you and listening to several of your interviews, what a beautiful spirit you have. You know, when I, when I heard your story, Lorna, I was like, what a beautiful soul of just someone who's so humble and so open, just willing to be used in that sense. You know, even with all the things that you struggle with your whole life, you're saying, oh, you're able to this, you're able to that, but you availed yourself. And that is something that I admire so much more than someone who has all the intellect in the world. You know, but here you are, who you say you can't really read or write much, but you have several bestsellers. So what that says a lot about your trust. And to me, that is something very admirable, Lorna. That that was I was drawn to you um, to invite you on the show. And so I want to just say thank you for taking the time and for all the wonderful work that you're doing to helping people all over the world. And I just discovered you recently. So I'm, you know. I just had to have you on, <laughs> you, know, had to, you know, pick your brain a little bit and get some questions answered for people who are, you know, um, following my channel. But yeah, thank you for all the compassion. It's, the compassion is so evident there. And so I just want to say thank you. I just want to say thank you to yourself. I really enjoyed chatting with you. And I'm being told to tell you, you should be, you know, realizing how wonderful and great you are as well i'm nobody you are somebody and and i i have to say it that way because because i don't matter it's you that matters it's every human being out there that matters not me not me in that in that way and i just like to say to all of your listeners i love them Mm. And I wish them a happy Christmas, whether they celebrate it or not. <laughs> yeah. you know? and, and I ask for good blessings for the new year for everyone and that our governments and leaders start to make some of the right choices for the people that they think of the people of the world. Yeah. That's, that's very, very important. So just thank you so much. And please, God, you'll come to Ireland or whatever. <laughs> Awesome. Oh, I'd love so to stay, visit you stay, out there. Stay in touch. Go, go to Sanctuary. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you, you and your beautiful wife. Thank you. Have Thank children. you. Children. Oh, not yet. Yeah. Not yet. Not, not yet. yet. You're, yeah. You're One of young. these days. <laughs> I'm, tur- I'm turning 43 next month. So. Well, yeah. you're a young man. You're yeah, still, still young. young. Yeah, okay. but th- thank you so much, Lorna, for your time. And what an honor to have you on the show. So thank you. Once again, thanks for watching, everyone. Till next time, we're out. Peace.